I need to begin by addressing the people watching on YouTube. Uh, and the reason why is because if you are watching this on YouTube right now, you might be confused because if you look through our playlist, you will see that there is not a video covering 1 Kings chapter 7. That is 100% my fault because last week we got together for Bible study and we did a two-hour Bible study through 1 Kings chapter 7. And I'm not going to lie, I thought it was actually a really good discussion. Right? It was a bit of a weird chapter to go through because it was covering mainly architectural details. But I thought we managed to have a really good discussion and we talked about some good application points at the end and everything. And whenever we finished, I looked at my computer and realized that I had forgotten to click record. So that is 100% on me. That's why you don't see that. That being said, now I'm talking to all of us here. Today, we are going to spend a little bit longer on context uh, because I want to recap chapter 7 and I want to bring up some of the key points that we talked about, some of the application points. Um, and then we're going to go into chapter 8, which actually works out fine because chapter 8 is a really long chapter. And I was planning on splitting it up over two weeks anyways. Uh, and so this just kind of works out that we're going to recap chapter 7 and then go into chapter 8. And so uh, it, it kind of just works out that way and um, we'll be fine. And so um, this video will account for chapter 7 and 8. Um, in the title, I'm probably just going to put chapter 8, however many verses we get through. And I don't really have an end goal. I'm just going to kind of, once we get around 9 o'clock, I'll just wrap us up. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of what's going on there. I just wanted to give you all a heads up because uh, that's 100% on me. So, yeah. All right. That being said, let's not waste any time. Let's actually get to this. Uh, let me open up to 1 Kings right here. 1 Kings chapter 7. Um, well, actually, before that, can, I, can somebody just give me a brief recap of what the overall context is of First Kings, right? I don't need like an in-depth chapter-by-chapter thing or anything because we're going to spend more time <laughs> on Chapter 7 today, and so I want to allow time to actually get into Chapter 8. Uh, but can somebody tell me just the general context? What's going on? Uh, and make sure you talk loud for the camp, uh, <clears throat> microphone. King Solomon, David's son, mm -hmm. is building the temple of God right next to the palace. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so we're during the time period of the United Monarchy, you know, whenever... Uh, it's after the time period of the Judges. There's now a king over Israel. We've seen King Saul. We've seen King David. Now King Solomon's in charge. We've seen his early reign, and now he's basically... He's built the temple that David wanted built. Mm -hmm. Where he says it's that? also a monarchy, like the start of the mon monarchy. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah, peaceful, peaceful. Yes, yeah. And th things are going really well right now, right? Yeah, right now yeah. we are currently... Um, we are in the chapters, which I would argue are probably the height of Israeli prosperity for all history so far, right? Like we are literally like, if you're thinking about just the overall flow of where Israel is at on the map and what's been going on with it, this is the peak, right? And ever since then, we have never gotten back to Solomonic times, right? Like whenever people think of King David and King Solomon, they think of Israel at its best, right? And whenever you get to Solomon literally dedicating the temple, this is probably at its peak, right? So what we're going to cover today, starting in chapter 8, we are literally at the top of Israelite history, which is kind of really cool, but also kind of sad when you realize that it's just going to go downhill from here, right? But uh, we've come a long way, right? Because we started this whole thing going through Judges, right? And so we've seen this slow, like we saw it go downhill and then uphill and it's been kind of going back and forth. But here we are at this high point, which is really, really cool. And so, uh, in chapter 6, we actually got to see the really the temple begin to be constructed. right? There's really been several chapters dedicated to this whole thing. Uh, and chapter 6 was whenever the temple was constructed. And in chapter 7, uh, I, I, call, I originally called that, if there had been a YouTube video, what it was going to be called was going to be called the houses which Solomon built. Because uh, it was going to be the house of Yahweh and the house of Solomon. Right, because the first half of chapter seven basically just details um, Solomon's construction of his like palace complex, right? Mm -hmm. And then it went back and detailed more furnishings in the temple, right? So if you're actually looking at chapter six and seven together, you have temple, palace, temple, right? It's almost like the palace is just kind of sandwiched in between there, right? So you get to see the building of the temple and stuff like that, mm -hmm. then the palaces, and then like the other extra stuff that we talked about in chapter seven. That being said, let's actually just kind of go through chapter 7 real quick. We're not going to read it verse by verse, uh, but I do want to detail like what was being described. And so maybe if you've got like a physical Bible, open up to it with me real quick so that we can walk through it. Um, just so that the people on YouTube can at least, you know, 
they can get a little bit of what we covered uh, last time, and then we'll go into chapter 8. All right, so how did chapter 7 <coughs> open up? And, but, and we will talk application stuff later, but um, we'll, get, we'll talk about that at the very end before we go into chapter 8. And initially it tells us that it took Solomon 13 years to complete the construction of his palace. Yeah, so yes, right? And so how long did it take Solomon to complete the construction of the temple? Do you remember? It was at, this is at the very end of chapter 6. Seven years. Yeah, it took seven years for the construction of the temple, 13 years for the construction of the palace. Some people will bring this up, and they'll suggest that this means that Solomon's priorities were entirely wrong, and that he devoted so much more time to building the palace and the temple, and that he was focused on himself. I don't think that's what the author's trying to communicate here. Right? There are other places where the author will criticize Solomon for what he's done, I think right here, it's probably just a matter of priorities, right? Solomon, his priority was building the temple. And so as we saw in the chapters, he employed hundreds of thousands of people to get this job done. And so the fact that it got done in seven years is not a testimony to like him being less focused on the temple. It's probably because he was so focused on the temple that the job got, got done so quickly. Whereas with the palace, he, he didn't probably employ a hundred, like hundreds of thousands of people. Right? He probably just employed the normal amount of people that you would employ for a building project. So it took longer. Right? I think it's just stating a factual detail. It's not stating anything to where you're... I don't think you're supposed to come to a weird conclusion about that yet. Right? I think Solomon is... We're supposed to respect what Solomon's doing right here, not be looking down upon it. Right? The other, that stuff's going to come later on. Right? So we see that Solomon spent 13 years building his own house. And whenever it says house, you have to realize it's not just one house. It's a building complex. Right, and so we talked about. Uh, there's really three main different buildings that there was. There was there was the um, the house of the forest of Lebanon, right? Then there's like the house of the pillars, and then there's the throne house, right? Like the throne room, right? The throne room is what it sounds like. It's basically where the the throne would be at. It's where Solomon would render his judgments. The the room of the pillars. Um, people speculate about what this would be. Um, it's probably just another like gathering place where they would have judicial stuff. Uh, or it could have just been the long entryway. Um, like it, we talked about how the structure of this is very similar to the structure of the temple, right? And then the house of the forest of Lebanon, um, it's most likely called that because it was built by the you know the cedars of Lebanon. So if you went in there, it was probably just constructed primarily of wood, and so it was metaphorically like a forest, right? Whereas a lot of houses back then would not be like that. They mainly be stone and stuff. So whenever you walked in, there was like, wow, did you import the whole forest of Lebanon in here? That's kind of what that was about. What are some other things we might have mentioned whenever we walked through that that maybe stuck out to y'all? Yeah. Uh, Solomon's palace is very similar to the temple. Like the throne room is where the the ark would be. Yeah, it's parallel to the Holy of Holies and stuff like that. Yeah. So Solomon designed his palace with a very similar architectural design that mirrored that of the temple. Right. Uh, And we brought that up again whenever it came to the application stuff. Um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, anything else that y'all remember we talked about um, from that section? There was a separate house for Pharaoh's daughter. Yes, there was. Uh, there was a separate house for Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, and if you remember, we met Pharaoh's daughter, I believe, back in chapter, was it two or three? Um, no. I think I actually made it in uh, two. Or three. Yeah. I think it was chapter three. Yeah. Yeah. Then Solomon formed a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her to the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. Right? So he brought her there and he built her a separate house. Right? It's just like across the way. Uh, which does suggest to you that, once again, this marriage is more of a political alliance than it is anything else to where they're not even living in the same place. He has built a separate palace for her. Right? Yes? I also want to mention that David had already wrote up the plans for the temple without actually constructing it. Yes, that's another thing. We did address that as well. He, he was like, you told me I can't make the plan. You told me I can't build it, but who said I can't make the plans? Yes. Um, nowadays, we love getting, like, we love working our way around rules thanks to technicalities. People in the Bible did that as well, right? As far back as Genesis, you people, you see people being like, well, technically, um, like, this is how it works, right? And King David did the same thing. God told him, you're not allowed to build the temple. And David said, you said I couldn't build it. You didn't say that I couldn't draw out the floor plans, gather the materials, and basically get Solomon everything he needed. So basically, this whole construction project is more like a really giant, a, a giant IKEA assembly package, basically. 
where Solomon has to basically get the workers, bring in a little bit more material, and then just fulfill what his dad had asked him to make, right? Uh, anything else in verses 1 through 12 that stuck out to y'all? Because chap- verses 1 through 12 are the main thing about Solomon's palace. I think another thing probably just worth highlighting is that, once again, even this stuff, it wasn't nearly as fancy as the temple, but it was still really fancy, right? Uh, And one thing we highlighted was how meticulous Solomon is. Like, everything he does, and we see this both in his palace and in the temple, it's very ornate, it's designed very beautifully, right? And I imagine that if you actually saw it in person, it'd be even fancier than what you see described here, right? But the author does go out of his way to describe how fancy it is. Right? I mean, he doesn't probably mention every single little detail, but he gives enough detail for you to realize, oh, Solomon really made them put in the work. Like, he wanted this stuff to be nice. Uh, but his palace does pale in comparison to God's. Because mm-hmm. that's really what the, the temple is, right? The temple is God's palace. And so, if you were to come into Jerusalem, it would be very clear who the real king of Jerusalem is. Right? It's not Solomon. It's God. Mm-hmm. Right? Whereas, um, like, if you were to see the temple nowadays... It would still be beautiful and crazy ornate because of how much gold and stuff there is. But the size of the building isn't that huge compared to like modern day buildings, right? Modern day buildings are way bigger than what Solomon's temple was. Hola. Mm -hmm. Um, Modern day buildings are way bigger. Um, But um, if you were to go back in time and if you were to look at other kingdoms and other places like that, uh, the temples that you found in other cities would not be nearly as nice as palaces, right? Because temples were places where you went to worship, but by and large, they were just like stone structures. Whereas Solomon's was a full-out palace. Um, Also, just so y'all know what we're doing, um, since I forgot to click record last week, we're spending a little bit longer in our little recap of 1 Kings chapter 7, because just for the people on YouTube to... Yes, yeah. Um, It's an easy chapter to recap, too, because, you know... Uh, Okay, so that was verses 1 through 12. And then verses 13 through the end of the chapter, those are all back to the temple, right? So spending more time recapping temple stuff. Um, We start off, uh, Now uh, King Solomon sent and brought Hiram from Tyre. We talked about Hiram. This is a different Hiram from Tyre than Hiram King of Tyre, right? We talked about that guy. Hiram King of Tyre, he's the one who actually sent the Lebanon and stuff to Solomon. This Hiram is actually... Um, he's, he's mixed blood, right? Because it told us he was a widow's son from the tribe of Naphtali, and his father was a man from Tyre, a worker in bronze, right? So this guy, he has the same name as the king, but he's a different dude. Um, he's half Israelite, half, I don't know, Tyranese? I, I don't know what a person from Tyre is. Um, half, I guess, Lebanese, really. Um, but he, he's half and half, but he is a, um, he's a bronze worker, right? And so now that they have constructed the temple, what we're really going to see in this chapter is um, really the metalworking. Right, and so he hires Hiram, he hires Hiram, <laughs> and Hiram comes down, and Hiram's basically going to be the guy to do the job, because Hiram's reputation is that he is, like, good, good, good when it comes to metalworking, right? Like, he can accomplish basically anything, right? His reputation precedes him. And so Solomon says, that's the guy for my job. He brings Hiram down, and what do we see, uh, what's the first thing that we see Hiram build? Verses 15 through 22. Two bronze pillars, each 18 cubits high, and 12 cubits in circumference. Yeah, so he builds these big bronze pillars, um, and they're they're, they're giant, and what they're going to be is they're going to be in front of the entryway to the temple, right? So you've got the temple structure, and then as you're walking in, there's these two pillars. What are their names? Oh. It's Joaquin and Boaz, right? We kind of talked a little bit about that, but really nobody can agree on why they're named that, and so we didn't spend too much time speculating. Uh, but the pillars were actually named, Joaquin and Boaz. I'm sure they had reasons for it. Um, and these pillars, they represent different stuff, um, but the main thing I've been trying to highlight with all of this is the Eden-like imagery that we see littered throughout this, right? Why is it that we see so much Eden-like imagery when it comes to the construction of the temple? 
temple represents where, like, God's presence is dwelling? And yeah. And God's presence was dwelling in the Garden of Eden? Exactly, right? And so anytime you see, basically, a place that represents where God dwells, there's going to be things that are calling back to the Garden of Eden, because that's really, like, if you read Genesis 1 and 2, people argue that really that is God constructing a temple for himself, right? Like, whenever you read the creation story, God is creating a metaphorical temple, and it's going to be the earth, right? And he is coming to dwell there with man, and his holy of holies is the Garden of Eden, right? And so you read that there's all this water, and there's gold, and all this stuff, and he dwells with man there. But then, uh, whenever man gets kicked out, what does God place at the entrance to the Garden of Eden? Cherubim. Cherubim, right? And that's why you see cherubim all the time in like the temple, and the Ark of the Covenant and stuff. Because cherubim are the ones that guard the way into God's presence, right? Uh, and in a way, you can kind of view these pillars kind of like that. But even more than them being the cherubim, I would actually argue that they almost represent the entrance to the garden itself, right? Um, because if you actually look at the Hebrew word for garden that you see back in Genesis, the word actually refers to like an enclosed space. So some people have speculated that it might have actually been like a walled area, or at the very least, there's like clear boundary markers, right? So whenever it says that there was an entrance to the garden for the cherubim to guard at, that implies that they had to exit from somewhere. There was an entrance and an exit. Well, it seems like that's what these golden pillars are marking, right? They are the entrance into the presence of God. And sure enough, we read about this in chapter 6. When you walked through the entrance and you came into the room, what was one of the first things that you saw? Remember, there were the big cherubim statues, right? And the wings met in the center and stuff like that. And so you do have cherubim inside the temple. So right once you get past the entrance, who's guarding the way? The cherubim, right? So it all calls back to the Garden of Eden. And whenever you actually look at these pillars, uh, remember there's like these, these giant capitals on top and there were these pomegranates and these chains and all this stuff. Uh, once again, all Eden-like imagery. Uh, we even talked about the, um, there's, there's a lily design. Right? And I talked about the comparison, like Solomon, he also wrote a book called Song of Solomon. Right? And whenever you see lilies mentioned in the Song of Solomon, it's always imagery that kind of has this sexual connotation. Right? It was where the, um, you know, the, man, like, the man would browse among the lilies. Right? It's the idea of him and his wife enjoying intimacy together. Well, uh, we've also talked about how the temple in and of itself is metaphorically being represented as almost a bride. Right? To where if you look at the Hebrew words, the temple has a face, the temple has shoulders, the temple has ribs. Right? It's almost like Solomon is creating a bride for God to come into. Right? Uh, and so whenever God enters into the temple, it's, it's almost like a metaphor uh, for this like, beautiful union. Right? Which makes sense because nowadays, where, who is the temple of God? His church. The church. Right? The church is the temple of God. And what also are we? the bride of Christ, right? And so the temple kind of represents this meeting place, which makes sense because whenever a man and a woman come together in marriage, they become one flesh, right? Well, the temple is where God, where heaven and earth meet and kind of become one, right? And so that's kind of the imagery that we have going on here as well. Uh, and so you have these lilies on the columns as well, right? Uh, so that's verses 15 through 22. Uh, and then whenever you go from 23 through 26, what do we see there? What's the next thing that Solomon has Hiram make? It's like big water basins. A big water basin, right? This is the giant one. This is the bronze sea, right? And remember, we also talked about how inside the temple, what is the main material we have? What? Like cedar. Uh, well, um, when it comes to metal, oh. gold. Inside the temple is gold. Outside the temple is bronze. There's probably practical reasons behind this because gold is less durable, and so gold is in an enclosed space. Bronze is more durable. It's outside. Um, but also, as you're going closer to the presence of God, it gets more um, valuable. valuable. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so outside, um, if you're in the outer courtyard, there's this big bronze basin. And this thing's pretty huge, right? It like holds like a bunch of gallons of water, right? It, it's huge. It, it's rightfully called a bronze sea. It's like a giant pool. Um, and the bronze sea is lifted up high in the sky because it sits on top of 12 statues of oxen, Right? Um, and we talked about this uh, because whenever you hear the number 12 in relation to Israel, what do you immediately think of? The 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 tribes of Israel, right? And oxen, what do they usually kind of represent? Uh, 
What do oxen usually represent? Like sacrifice? Um, not necessarily sacrifice. I mean, I guess it could be. Like strength. Uh, usually it represents strength, right? Strength of some sort. And so if you think about it, you've got this bronze sea being held up by the oxen. Um, and, and once again, I don't like to over-speculate about this stuff, but whenever you're reading the overall Old Testament like story, there's very clear imagery going on here. So um, if, if you're not as familiar with the Old Testament, this sound it almost sounds like you're pulling stuff out of your butt and just guessing. But there's certain themes and motifs that come up enough to where when you look at it, it doesn't seem accidental, right? And you do have to wonder why they did it this way. Right, so it seems like these oxen will represent the twelve tribes, right? Uh, and metaphorically, like, well, they're holding up this sea, and later on in the story, right? Later on in the Old Testament, uh, whenever you have prophets who are having a vision of the throne room of God, you always have God's throne being in front of this large glassy sea, right? Well, inside the temple is God's throne room, right? And so just outside of it, just like in the visions that you have of heaven. There's this glass sea, right? And then you have these 12 oxen who are holding up the sea, which would almost be like, like heaven itself sitting on the shoulders of the tribes of Israel, right? Uh, which makes sense because who has God revealed himself to the world through? Israel, right? And so really, um, Israel is the metaphorical atlas of the story. You know, atlas from Greek mythology, where he's like holding the sky and holding the earth on his shoulders. That's kind of what Israel is to the rest of the world, right? So Israel is the oxen holding up the heavens on their shoulders, right? The throne room of God is in their presence. And you have three oxen facing each direction, north, south, east, west. And that's because they're facing outwards into the Gentile world, right? So here they are holding out the heavens, but they're not looking inwards towards themselves. They're looking outwards into the world because ultimately that's the goal of Israel, right? Their goal is to guide people to God, right? It's to look out to the Gentiles so that the Gentiles will come to them and come to worship God through them. And once again, when you get to the prophets, and we're even going to see hints at this in chapter 8 here, um, God's going to say, my house shall be a house of prayer for all the nations, right? It's not just supposed to be a house of prayer for the Jewish people. It's supposed to be for everybody. This is what's going to make Jesus so mad whenever he shows up and they have turned the court of the Gentiles into a marketplace, because the inner sanct- like the inner parts for the Jewish people, that was fine. But there was one court at Jesus' time that was set up for the Gentiles to come worship God. And they had turned that place into a marketplace. And Jesus gets ticked. He starts flipping tables. And he says, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer for all the nations. Right? The reason he's mad is because this is the place where Gentiles and Jews are supposed to come worship God. But the Jews weren't really caring for the Gentiles that much. And so he is mad about that. Right? And so you've got this bronze sea sitting on the shoulders of the oxen who are looking out into the Gentile world, beckoning them to come in and worship God. Right? So that was the next thing there. Then you get to verses 27 through 37. And what does he make there? The stands of bronze. Yes, the stands of bronze. And what sits on top of these stands of bronze? Uh, they actually describe them as like chariots. Right? Like, so that's, um, the stands, they're like basically these like bronze boxes, and they have like four wheels each. They're pretty big, right? Um, they have four wheels each. Or really, it's more just like a, like they, it calls them chariots. We can probably think of them as almost like wagons, right? They're just like these boxy, like just cubes with four wheels on them so they can move around. But they also have a stand on top of them, and what sits on the stand? This is down in verses 38 through 39. Does anybody remember? Didn't know you were going to be quizzed today, did you? Is it like the baths? The baths, right? Yeah, so uh, basically just smaller versions of the sea, right? So the bronze sea is like this huge like pool of water, but then... You have these smaller, just like really big bowls of water, uh, which they call them baths, right? Uh, And they sit on the sands, right? And so these are mobile. uh, And what Solomon does is if you're walking through the courtyard to the entryway to the temple, he takes these 10 stands and he puts five on one side and five on the other, right? Uh, And there's there's a bunch of imagery that would fit into this, right? First off, whenever you go to the Garden of Eden, what do we learn about the garden when it comes to water? Well, yeah, there's water everywhere, right? It's, it's a 
place flowing with water, right? It, it lists that there's four rivers that surround on all sides. This is something we take for granted nowadays because we don't have like, we're not running low on water and stuff like that. But in ancient cultures, you got to realize this is how you decided where you were going to live, right? You wanted to be living near a place that had a water source, right? If there was no water nearby, you would die, right? And so the Garden of Eden, one of the quickest ways that you point out that it's a place of luxury is you point out it is surrounded by rivers, right? There's the Pishon, the Gihon, the Tigris, the Euphrates. It's a well-watered place. All right, so when you go to the temple, there's water everywhere. There's this huge sea of water. There's these rivers of water running on both sides, right? There's a lot of water. But then, metaphorically speaking, think about it. As you're walking closer to the Holy of Holies, what you're doing is you're walking on dry ground through parted waters, right? So there's water over here, water over here, and you're walking closer to the presence of God through parted waters. Is that relevant to Israel's history? Absolutely, right? Because how, whenever they were delivered from slavery, what did they do? They walked through parted waters on the Red Sea, right? Water to the right, water to their left. They walked across, and where did they go? Mount Sinai, right? Who met them at Mount Sinai? God. He descended in a thick cloud and came to dwell there and gave them the law. Okay, well, guess what we're going to read in chapter 8? God is going to descend in a thick cloud and make his presence dwell in the temple. Mm-hmm. Same thing. All right. But whenever they left Mount Sinai and they wandered through the wilderness for 40 years, and it came time for them to enter the promised land, what did they have to do? Cross the Jordan. They had to cross the Jordan River. Did they just jump it, or what happened? It parted. It parted again, right? And you had the Ark of the Covenant to go across first, and then everybody else followed. And once again, they parted. They walked across dry ground through parted waters to go into the place that God had promised them. And ultimately, the reason they wanted to go there is because God had promised he was going to make his name dwell at a certain place there. In 1 Kings chapter 8, we're going to see him make his name dwell there. Right? And so, as you're walking into the temple from the outer courtyard, right, you walk in, and the closer you get to the Holy of Holies, you're walking through, like, you're walking through parted waters on dry ground. You're walking underneath the sea of water, right, where the heavens are at. You're going through the gates into the into Eden. You're passing by the cherubim, and you're getting closer and closer to the presence of God, right? So it's almost like you're like you're exiting Egypt again. You're approaching Mount Sinai. You're entering into the Promised Land. You're entering into the Garden of Eden. Like there's all these different ways that the people of Israel would have viewed this, and all that's at play whenever you're reading the story. All right, uh, verses forty through. Um, 40 through 47, uh, what we see there is that it basically just says that Hiram made a bunch of other utensils. Uh, we don't have to go through those. He, basically, he made shovels and all that stuff. Other things that would be necessary to actually go about temple practices, mm-hmm. right? So he made the shovels so that they could like you know shovel coals and stuff like that. Uh, and then in verses 48 through 50, um, Solomon makes um, other furniture that's going to go inside the house, right? So this is stuff made of gold. Right, he makes the altar, uh, the golden table, uh, where the bread, of the presence is going to go. If you're familiar with the instructions on the tabernacle and stuff, all of this is parallel. Uh, it also says that he made uh, he made more lampstands. Right, five on the right side and five on the left side. Uh, in the tabernacle, there was only one lampstand. Solomon, being the extravagant guy that he is, he makes ten. Right, and so if you're going into the temple itself, it's not just slightly lit up. Like, and imagine this, right? Because what is the wall, what are the walls of the temple lined with? Gold, right? Imagine walking into this room lined with gold, and you just got like these ten giant candle like candelabras lighting the whole place. Like just imagine what a spectacle it would be. All the light, like just the, like it would be something that a light bulb wouldn't even fully accomplish, right? The flickering lights bouncing off the walls, like it would be a spectacle walking into this place, mm-hmm. right? It's crazy. Um, it, it would almost like it would kind of almost look like angels like flying you know like just moving around um, which could be intentional I don't know uh, and he makes all this other stuff uh, and thus we read uh, thus we read and then we read verses 51 um, and 52 or there's 51 I guess uh, thus all the work that King Solomon performed in the house of the Lord was finished and Solomon brought in the things dedicated by his father David the silver and the gold and the utensils and he put them in the treasuries of the house of the Lord right 
that's how chapter 7 ends. Um, and that's the stuff we covered last week. But before we jump into chapter 8, real quick, I do want to briefly address the, um, the application points that we talked about. I wrote them down. There were really three main ones that we talked about. Uh, the first one that we mentioned was the aspect of Solomon sparing no expense for all the stuff that he did. Right? We made a big emphasis on the fact that Solomon was really blessed by God. Right? Remember like the whole encounter where God uh, asked, told Solomon to ask for whatever he wanted and Solomon asked for wisdom? Well, God said, you know what? Because you asked for that, I'm going to give you fame and fortune and all that stuff. And God didn't give any like disclaimers there. He didn't say, but if I give you money, you better use that money on me. He didn't require Solomon to do that. Solomon chose to do that. Right? So God gave him all this fortune, and where does Solomon put that money back into? The temple of God. Right? I mean, he's got billions of dollars. I mean, literally. Like, like I've mentioned this before. This necklace is gold, and it's probably worth a lot of money. Right? This thing is tiny. Imagine you walk into a building where the walls are lined with gold, and the furniture is made of gold, and everything else is made of bronze. <coughs> this thing is billions of dollars worth. And a lot of it, people are never even going to see, right? But there's an applicational point here of the idea that Solomon realized that God was worth every expense that he had, right? And Solomon, but like, there's this general idea throughout the Bible that in order for something to genuinely be considered worship, it has to require some level of sacrifice, mm-hmm. right? Like, like, that's just something that we see throughout the Bible. Uh, whenever Abraham purchases the cave of Machpelah, Right, the very first piece of land he ever owned in the land of Canaan. People try to give it to him. And he insists, no, 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 I want to purchase it. Right? Because this is an first off, he wanted it to be a legally binding agreement. He didn't want them to be able to take it back later. But it was also because God had given him money and God had given him a promise. Right? And he didn't want to just freely accept this. He wanted to use the money that God had given him in order to purchase this thing, in order to like, officially seal this covenant. Mm-hmm. Same thing whenever David purchase the land that the temple is going to be built on, right? We read about this at the end of 2 Samuel, right? They tried to just give it to him, and he said, no, I want to pay for it, right? Because there's this general idea that in order for something to be worship, it needs to cost you something. And if it doesn't cost you anything, is it really worship? No. Then you're just, I don't know, it's just, it's just ooey-gooey feeling stuff, right? I guess it can be worshipful, but it's not the essence of worship, right? And so Solomon, he is giving his everything, to this. So application wise, we were saying we should probably try to find ways to do that, right? Spare no expense, right? The way that Paul talks about it in Second Timothy, I am being poured out as a drink offering. The way that Peter and John put it, uh, whenever you encou- they encounter the um, the lame man in Acts chapter three, I have no silver or gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand up, mm-hmm. right? We might not have the same silver or gold that Solomon has, but God has given us plenty of things. And we should use those things to glorify him so that whether you're eating or drinking, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God, right? It should cost you something. And if it's not costing you something, it might not be worship. That was the first thing we talked about. A second thing we talked about was the parallel between Solomon's house and God's house, right? Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but, you know, Sol- the way that Solomon designs his palace is very similar to how God's palace is designed, right? The temple and the palace like layout, very similar. Uh, And we talked about how, basically, um, this is kind of how we should try to make our lives, right? Um, How, like, if currently the church of God is the temple of God, well, then we should strive to make it so that our families and our households are trying to achieve the same goals that the church is trying to achieve, right? And this is not simply the same as slapping a Bible verse on the wall or, you know, putting your, you know, putting a Bible verse in your Instagram captions, There's got to be something more to it than just that, right? It is literally a question of what does it look like to serve God as a household, right? Like Solomon, he went to the pains of literally designing his house to where, like, if you compare the two, there's a very clear parallel. All right, so if there's certain things that we're saying, this is what our goal is as a church, how do we embody that as a family, right? How do we embody that lifestyle just personally in our own individual lives, Right? We should model those things after one another. Uh, whereas a lot of times what you'll see is you'll see people come into a church and they'll criticize the church for its shortcomings whenever their own families are guilty of the same exact thing. 
right? But really, the church is supposed to function like a family, right? And so sometimes maybe it might start with us applying it in our own households, and then it will begin to affect the church as a whole, right? Uh, was there anything else that we really talked about in regards to that, like, like that specific application point? I don't think so. Okay. Um, yeah, so just making sure our private lives reflect the lives that um, we give to the church, right? Uh, we we want to make that consistency evident, right? Because there's a lot of people who go to church and act one way, they go home and act a different way. We want to look the same both ways. And then the third and final application point we talked about is just the fact that we are God's temple, right? Uh, we should dedicate as much care and precision as Solomon and Hiram did to making sure that we are, being fit, uh, we are fit to belong to the temple of God, right? Whenever you're reading through this story, uh, Hiram and Solomon dedicate, I mean, the amount of detail that they show for every little thing, right? I mean, there's literally places where, like, remember Solomon was, like, telling Hiram, like, hey, there's too much free space here. Like, I want you to cover that up with, like, engravings. Right? The idea is that they were meticulous and they wanted every single aspect of this temple to be beautiful and glorifying to God. Right? They wanted to make sure that the edges of the stones were chiseled perfectly. And think about how much harder that is nowadays, or, or back then, than it was now. It is nowadays. Right? Nowadays, we have all these like huge construction tools and you know, like we have bulldozers and stuff like that. They didn't have that back then. Right? And so if they were wanting to make this nice, it had to be done by hand. Right? They're just chiseling away. That says something, right? The amount of effort they were willing to put in to this amazing building that by and large, only a handful of people would really get to actually see shows that we should also show the same respect to our temple, right? And once again, whenever we say that we're the temple of God, I'm not just talking about me individually, us as a whole, right? But it starts with us individually, right? Because we might not be the temple individually, but each of us are stones or candlesticks or bronze seas or oxen or you know basins like we all are individual parts of the temple and solomon showed attention to every single part even the parts that nobody else would see we should do the same thing in our own lives right we want to examine everything about ourselves external and internal and make sure that we are living lives that are fit to be part of the temple of god right that's really what we should be taking out of this Right? If the Bible slows down to tell us this information, it's because it's important. And so we want to make sure that we are fit to be in the temple of God, and we should be helping one another be fit to be the temple of God, so that in the end we will be a bride that is radiant for our groom. Right? So that whenever he returns, he will look and say, that is a fancy temple. I would love to dwell in that temple. Right? Uh, we don't want Jesus to return and ask the question that he posed in the Gospels, where he says, when the Son of Man returns to earth, will he find any faith? We don't want to be like that. We want to be like the bride described in Ephesians, right? Whenever it says, you know, wives submit to your husbands and husbands love your wives. And it talks about how the husband's goal should be to prepare a wife that is radiant, right? That's what we want to be, right? And that's what we do as the temple of God. We take, like, we try to make sure that we have nothing that can be held against us. We help edify the church. So whenever Jesus comes back, we are a good-looking temple, one that he would delight to dwell with. So those are the application points. Were there any other things that y'all thought we needed to address before we actually go to chapter 8? All right, cool. So once again, sorry that we had to do a little bit longer context there, but it is what it is. And hey, now you have gone through chapter 7 twice. <laughs> so look at that. Um, now you know chapter 7 very well. That being said... Today we get into what I think is one of the best chapters in 1 Kings. And that's why I wanted to split it up over two weeks. Because we are going to get to see Solomon pray one of the most amazing <coughs> prayers ever. I think it's actually the longest prayer recorded in the Bible. And it is great. right? And it's all to dedicate the temple and just like rejoice in who God is and what he's done. And it's going to be reflecting on a lot of just like biblical history and stuff. And you really feel the weight of this all. Like, you feel the momentous occasion that is taking place right here uh, to where it really does feel like the climax of the biblical story thus far, right? What started in the Garden of Eden is now kind of being brought to a resolution here, which is going to make it all the more heartbreaking when in just a few chapters it all falls apart because really it feels like this is what everything was building up to, right? Back in the Garden of Eden, we sinned and we got kicked out of God's presence. 
And now here we are, we've taken this whole journey, right? The people have gone down into slavery, they have come out, they've gone through the wilderness, they've gotten to the promised land, they've gone through the period of the judges, which was not a good period. They had their first king, which was not a great king. They had their second king, who made things a lot better. And now with King Solomon, he has constructed a new Eden for God to come dwell in. And that's what the story is about, right? It's about God coming to dwell with man. And so it almost feels like, like this is a foreshadowing of Revelation, right? In Revelation chapter 22, we are going to see the same thing happening, but it's actually going to stick, right? The issue with this one is it's only going to be a temporary reprieve, right? Which is going to make it even sadder because whenever you get to the chapters when it all falls apart, it's going to be like a second false story. And it's going to be even more heartbreaking because we should have done better. <coughs> Right? But this really does feel like the climax of the story. Right? Like, like if, if it ended after chapter 8, like if the Bible ended there, I think it would feel like a satisfying story. But it doesn't end there. And so we're going to keep reading on afterwards. But let's go into it. The dedication of the temple. Take it away, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes the leaders of the fathers' households of the sons of Israel, to King Solomon in Jerusalem, to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh from the city of David, which is, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled themselves to King Solomon at the feast, in the, in the month Ethanaim, which is the seventh month. Then all the elders of Israel came, and the priests carried the Ark. And they brought up the Ark of Yahweh in the tent of meeting, and all the holy utensils which were in the tent. And the priests and the Levites brought them up, and King Solomon and all the congrega congregation of Israel who congregated to, to him, being with him before the ark, were sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. Then the priests brought the ark of the covenant of Yahweh to its place, and to the inner sanctuary of the house, to the holy of holies, <coughs> under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread their wing, wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubim made a covering over the ark and its poles from above. But the poles were so long that the ends of the poles could be seen from the holy place before the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen outside. And they are there to this day. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone which Moses laid there at Horeb, where Yahweh cut a covenant with the sons of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. Now it happened that when the priests came out of the holy place, the cloud filled the house of Yahweh, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of Yahweh filled the house of Yahweh. Good <coughs> stuff. Thank you, Sean. All right. Anything stick out to y'all right off the bat? Just the obvious parallel. It's like it mentions Moses and the tablets and the ark and then the cloud. There's definitely a, um, a continuation aspect to this. What does that seem to call back to? Anybody know how the book of Exodus ends? Let me read it to you. So, here's a brief recap of the book of Exodus. Right? The book of Exodus, um, anybody know what the word Exodus means? It's like departure. It means to depart, exit. Right? Like whenever I was in Greece back in February, if you see an exit sign, it says Exodus. Right? Like it means to exit, right? And the Exodus story is the story of the people of Israel exiting Egypt, right? Because they were in slavery and then they leave. Um, multiple times at the beginning of the story, Moses goes before Pharaoh and he says, Let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness, speaking on behalf of God. And that's really the structure of the book of Exodus, right? The first 15 chapters are about Pharaoh letting the people go, and then chapters 16 through 40 are about them learning to serve God in the wilderness. Right, so chapters 1 through 15, that's the Exodus story you're probably most familiar with. Right, this is where you have Moses called from the burning bush. He goes down, there's the ten plagues, there's the parting of the Red Sea, all that stuff. And that's chapters 1 through 15. Chapters 16 through 40 are the serving God in the wilderness part, uh, where once they get in the wilderness, they need to learn what it looks like to serve God. Chapter 19, they arrive at Mount Sinai. Chapter 20, God starts giving them the law. Right, that's where you get the Ten Commandments. Right? The people decide that they don't want to talk to God directly. And so starting in chapter 21, Moses becomes the mediator. He goes up and down, up and down, up and down the mountain, 
receiving the law from God and giving it to the people. And uh, in chapter 24-ish, they officially make their covenant with God. And then chapters 25 through 31, Moses goes up the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. And during this time period, God starts giving some instructions, right? He tells Moses that he wants to come dwell with the people. And so what Moses is going to do is he's going to have them build a tent, right? And this tent is going to have this section called the Holy of Holies. There's going to be the holy place. There's going to be this golden ark that goes inside the tent, and God's going to come dwell in it. This is going to be known as the tabernacle, right? The instructions for that tabernacle are found in chapters 25 to 31, and they're given during those 40 days that Moses is up on the mountain. However, during those 40 days that Moses is up on the mountain, uh, receiving the law from God on how God will come dwell with them, the people at the base of the mountain, they decide that they want to make a God for themselves. And so in chapter 32, Moses comes down to give them this law, and what have they done? They've made the golden calf, right? Chapters 32 to 34 detail basically the aftermath of that situation. Those are probably some of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible. If you know me well, I talk about them a lot. Uh, this is basically where God really just makes his character known. Right? But then, once you get past that section, the final six chapters, 35 through 40, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, those six chapters are detailing the actual construction of the Ark of the Covenant and the Tabernacle. Right? Uh, and so you had the instructions given, but then those then you have that one, like the, the golden calf debacle, as I like to call it. That takes place in 32 to 34. And the final six chapters detail the actual construction. And then the way that the book of Exodus ends is with this right here. Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 through 38. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. For throughout all their journeys, the cloud of Yahweh was on the tabernacle by day, and there was fire by night in the sight of all the house of Israel. That's how the book of Exodus ends, right? And so um, you can understand why it ends there, right? Because that's a kind of fitting conclusion. Genesis began with God and man dwelling together. Exodus ends with God and Israel dwelling together, right? And God came to dwell in the tabernacle, which is basically a mobile temple. Well, now we have a clear call back here, right? And so you have Moses, cloud, all that stuff. Anything else that sticks out to y'all? And once again, I'm not going to be in a huge rush to get through this stuff because we're going to split this chapter up over two weeks. Um, it's because it's a pretty long chapter as it is. And so we're going to take our time getting through it because I want us to understand it well. Anything else that sticks out to y'all before we walk through it? find it fascinating that they sacrificed so much they couldn't even record it or count it. Yeah. We've seen that be a repetitive thing in First Kings so far, huh? With the brass. Yeah. The, yeah. Not the bronze. bronze. Yeah. Uh, it just seems like this is just, it's a testimony to the wealth of Solomon and just how extravagant Solomon was. Because he didn't have to offer that many sacrifices, right? I mean, if you read the law, it'll give you like stipulations for how many sacrifices need to be offered for certain things. Solomon, what you have to know is he's an extreme guy, right? I, I imagine it'd be, Solomon would be an interesting person to be friends with because he picked up some of his dad's best and worst traits, right? David was a pretty extreme guy as well, but Solomon had that same extreme nature as David, but he also had like all this wealth and stuff to like, he was just very eccentric, right? It, it's kind of like a, I don't know, like I feel like if, Solomon was alive nowadays. He'd be more like a like Steve Jobs, Elon Musk type, or Howard Hughes, like a very eccentric person who just uses money to just do weird things, uh, and not always weird, but sometimes just like over the top, right? Uh, and sometimes that's good, sometimes it's bad. But in this instance, it's very good, right? He's just like sacrifice all the animals, right? Because he just has so much, right? Uh, to where uh, you, if this happened nowadays, you you know for a fact there would be fireworks, there would be all sorts of stuff, all the stuff I usually complain about in like church services, 
Solomon would probably have that. Um, but he would probably have it for the right reasons. Um, but, but he is trying to make this a show, right? This is just a huge thing. It's an event, right? This isn't how things are always going to be, but it's a coronation ceremony, right? The king is coming to dwell in his palace, and Solomon wants to give him the respect that he's due. Anything else? It mentions the uh, cherubim again, mm-hmm. where the, the cherubim have their wings over the where the Ark of the Covenant is going to be. Yeah, it lingers on that for a while. Like, it, like, <laughs> restates it multiple times, it's for like sure. the final, like, protection of, you know, God's presence. Like. Yeah. Well, it's emphasizing this is where God's yeah. going to dwell, for sure. I just find it fascinating that, like, uh, the presence of God dwells in the temple before the priests could even minister and give their service. It just shows how Solomon's heart was in the right place and how quickly God came. Yep, absolutely. Has it mentioned Zion yet? Um, in the Bible? I don't know. Let me look. What? Oh, it says it in verse 1? Yeah. Um, let me look. Um, da, 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 da. Let me check da, da, da. Zion. The first time that Zion shows up in the Bible is actually 2 Samuel chapter 5. Um, nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion. But this is only the second time it shows up. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Makes sense that he had David and just found him. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it shows up 2 Samuel 5, 7, and then this is the first time it shows up since then. But then, And then it actually isn't mentioned again until 2 Kings chapter 19. Interesting. Hmm. I don't know what to do with that information, but it's pretty cool. All right, let's walk through it. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the father's household, and the sons of Israel, to King Solomon in Jerusalem to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh from the city of David, which is Zion. So he's, a, he's essentially just getting all the important people. Yeah, he's getting all the important people. Um, what does this tell us? What does Solomon think about this event that's about to take place? important. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody who's somebody is here. Right? He has invited all the elders of Israel, all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the father's households of the sons of Israel. They all came to King Solomon in Jerusalem. Like he sent out invites. He probably told them to wear their best clothes. He said, I need all of y'all here because this is going to be the event you do not want to miss. Right? So they all came to King Solomon in Jerusalem. Why specifically are they coming? What, what's the main thing that's happening here? God's presence is coming. Yeah, specifically bringing the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh from the city of David, which is in Zion. Right? The temple's built, but the temple isn't important if God doesn't dwell there. Mm-hmm. Right? A palace might be cool, but the thing that makes the palace mean anything is the king's presence. Right? If the king doesn't live there, it's just a museum. Right? The king is the thing that makes the palace wonderful. Right? And so you can have this entire... Like, he didn't invite all these people up there to watch the construction of the temple. Despite the fact that, you know, there was all this gold and stuff like that. No. That stuff, he just had construction workers do it. But in order for the king to come dwell in the temple, he says, I want everybody here for this. Right? We are going to bring the ark... Into the temple. Interesting thing about this, though. This chapter is going to be the last time that we hear the Ark of the Covenant mentioned. We don't even know what happened to it, right? It's very like it's it's very strange. Like it's in this chapter, it's going to talk about the Ark of the Covenant, and then the Ark of the Covenant is just going to kind of fall off the face of the the, the story, right? To where even to this day, people don't know. Where it's at. I mean, according to Indiana Jones, it's sitting in some storage facility in a wooden box um, (laughs) after killing some Nazis. But we don't know where the Ark of the Covenant's at. Uh, And people speculate as to why this is. But it seems to be like that what happened is that the Ark of the Covenant was really God's dwelling place while they were moving around. But now that God has come to dwell on his throne in a set place, the Ark of the Covenant ceases to really be super important. Right? Because if the Ark of the Covenant was lost by accident or something like that, you would think that the text would mention it. But later on, like whenever you get to 2 Kings, it's going to detail Nebuchadnezzar coming in and stealing all the stuff out of the temple. And it's going to detail him stealing the candlesticks and all that stuff. It won't mention the Ark of the Covenant, though. 
which would suggest to us that by that time period, the ark was already gone. And we don't know when it happened, but if it happened accidentally, you would think it would mention it. Right? It would be like, oh yeah, somebody came in and stole the Ark of the Covenant. Because before when the Ark got taken, it was a big deal. Exactly. Uh, and so it seems to be, like there's like this kind of understated aspect to it, that once the Ark of the Covenant came to dwell there, it ceased to really have any value. Right? Because the Ark of the Covenant was only significant because that's where God dwelt. But now God's dwelling in a fixed place. Right? And it's not going to be moving from place to place, and so that is his home. Right? And so... Presumably, the Ark of the Covenant was just taken out of commission, but we, we don't know. There's people to this day who claim to have the Ark of the Covenant. There's like a church over in Ethiopia. Um, some of the Jewish people believe that it's literally hidden in some of the tunnels underneath the Temple Mount, stuff like that. Uh, very interesting. Yes? I, I even heard a story that it was like right below where Jesus got crucified and his blood came down and broke it in half and all this. Uh, people will also say that like Adam's skull is buried right underneath where Jesus was crucified and that like if you ever look at like artist paintings of Jesus being crucified, Sometimes you'll see a skull at the bottom of the cross, and that is supposed to be Adam's skull, because they'll say that's where Adam died at. Just, pe- people are very fanciful with a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> be, be careful with that. Um, but yeah, so Ark of the Covenant, I just think that's interesting, right? The Ark of the Covenant, it, it gets so much focus for so much of the Bible, but then after this chapter, it just kind of ceases to be important. I mean, it's mentioned again in like First Chronicles and stuff, but that's because it's retelling the same story. But after this... It just kind of disappears um, because it was never about the ark. It was always about what the ark brought with it, right? Mm-hmm. All right, so Solomon assembles the elders of Israel and the heads of the tribes and the leaders of the house, father's households and the sons of Israel to King Solomon in Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the covenant of Yahweh from the city of David, which is Zion. So where was the ark of the covenant at before? Was it like somebody's house? Well, it, it was, but then David moved it, Remember? And David brought it to Jerusalem, uh, where it basically just sat in a tent, right? But now Solomon is bringing it from there into the temple, uh, which really, this is not like a very far journey, right? Like if you're picturing Jerusalem on a map, like if you picture like, you've probably seen the maps of like Jerusalem at the time of Jesus, right? It's like a big old square, right? Well, if you go to the southeast corner of that whole design, there's like this tiny little sliver. Some of y'all's Bibles might even have maps in the back. Um, there's like this tiny little sliver part that's walled. That's the city of David, right? And then if you go directly north of that, that's where the temple's at, right? So the city of David's right here, and just like a short walk away would be where the temple's at. So this is not going to be like a long carry. Um, they're just moving it from one place to the other. That's all that's happening here. And so they're taking it from the city of David, which is Zion, and they're bringing it up into the temple. And all the men of Israel assemble themselves to King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ethanim, uh, which is the seventh month. Um, the seventh month then does not correspond to the seventh month now. Uh, do you know when Ethanim was? I believe I know. I just want to make sure. Yes. In actual months. My Bible here says September through October. It is September through October. Um, so Ethanim is the Jewish name for it. Uh, once they go off to Babylon, they're going to start using different names for their months. Uh, this corresponds to the month of Tishri. Right, uh, the month of Tishri is where you have the festivals of like the Day of Atonement, uh, Yom Kippur, uh, and also the Feast of Tabernacles, right, which they recently just celebrated last month, right. So that's what they're dealing with right here, right. So we actually just recently passed the anniversary of this whole event, right. So this is during the Feast of Tabernacles that they're doing all this, um, and so they assembled King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ethanim. So what feast are they at? If it's the feast in this month, is the one I just mentioned. Tabernacles. This is the Feast of Tabernacles, okay. right? Uh, and, and so um, this is actually kind of cool because God's presence came to dwell on Mount Sinai at the Feast of Pentecost, right? Uh, and I believe, when was it that God's presence came to dwell in the tabernacle? Um, I'm trying to remember if that was at a like, certain like feast. I don't remember. It could have been during Passover. I don't know. But Pentecost represents the first fruits, right? Tabernacles represents the harvest, right? And so what began at Pentecost with God coming to dwell at Sinai is now going to be completed at Tabernacles, right? The first fruits is now being completed at the harvest, right? And so uh, seventh month, this is when this is all happening. Then all the elders of Israel came and the priests carried the ark, right? I, I wish I could be there for this, 
right? Everybody's gathering. They're all excited. The only thing that can make this better is if we saw Solomon dancing like David, right? Uh, but Solomon, he's probably a little bit more dignified than that. <coughs> David just didn't care. Then all the elders of Israel came, and the priests carried the ark, and they brought up the ark of Yahweh and the tent of meeting and all the holy utensils which were in the tent, and the priests and the Levites brought them up. So if you remember, um, during the time period of David, it seemed like the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle were in different places, right? The tent of meeting is the same as the tabernacle, right? Um, because, and it seems like really the two had been separated ever since the whole incident back at the beginning of 1 Samuel, whenever they took the Ark out and the Philistines captured it, right? Because remember, the Philistines had captured the Ark, and then it had traveled around Philistine territory for a while, and then finally they just left it in some random dude's house, and meanwhile, the tabernacle's over at another place. Once David becomes king, he takes the Ark of the Covenant, brings it to Jerusalem, but we don't really see him doing anything with the tabernacle. Well, Solomon, he is reunifying that, right? So in addition to building the temple, Solomon's also reunifying their worship system, right? The tabernacle and the Ark are being reunited. So they brought the Ark of the Yahweh and the Tent of Meeting and all the holy utensils which are in the tent, and the priests and the Levites brought them up. Uh, in accordance with the law, right? The law gave very specific rules as to who was supposed to carry this stuff. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel. Fun fact about the word congregation. In Hebrew, this is the word kahel, right? If you were to look at the Septuagint, who, which, what is the Septuagint? Anybody remember? The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, Right? If you were to look at the Septuagint's translation here for the word congregation, kahel, in Greek it is ecclesia, right? Ecclesia, which is the word in the New Testament which is translated as church, right? The word church literally means congregation or assembly, right? So fun fact about this is that it's the same word, right? So you could say in King Solomon, all the church of Israel, right? So it's little, this is a church gathering, right? It's congregation, right? That's what it means. Whenever we say we go to church, we are going to the congregation, to the assembly. Um, so King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who congregated to him, being with him before the ark, were sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered, right? Once again, you have the idea that sacrifice equals worship, right? Um, because they don't have to give this much, but they are. And because they're giving more than that's required of them, what does that suggest about their love for God? It's overflowing. It's immense, right? Yeah, they've got a lot of love for God, right? If they didn't love God as much, they would probably just give the bare minimum, which, I mean, that wouldn't be a bad thing because they're at least doing what he asked, but that's not what they're doing. They're giving more than they have to, which tells you that they're worshiping, right? They're not just checking off boxes. They are giving all that they have to God. Um, this also might make sense as to why we call ourselves the church, right? Because we are an assembly, and right here, the assembly is gathering to the temple to worship God. Well, nowadays we don't need a temple because the assembly itself is the temple, right? And so, but, but that's still why we assemble together, right? Because separately, we're just little pieces of the temple. Together, we are the temple of God, right? And so we gather together to worship, right? And so that's kind of um, just... I like highlighting that type of stuff for us to understand that there is a theology behind this, right? There's a reason why Jesus uses this shirt, like when he says, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my ecclesia, right? This goes back to the Old Testament, right? It's not like church is just a New Testament thing. <clears throat> then the priests brought the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh to its place, into the inner sanctuary of the house, to the <coughs> Holy of Holies, under the wings of the cherubim. All right. What's the main point there? The Ark of the Covenant is being carried into the Holy of Holies. Yeah. Do you feel the weight of how this is being told, though? Right? Like, it could just say, and then they brought the Ark in and sat it down. But instead, the author is choosing to, like, you know, build it up for you. Right? The priest brought the Ark of the Covenant to its place. It could just stop there. There could be a period. But it keeps going. Into the inner sanctuary of the house. To the Holy of Holies. Under the wings of the cherubim. Right? Like, it's almost like he, he's wanting you to picture this. Right? They brought it to its place. You can see them, like, 
carrying it on their shoulders, walking, right? They go into the sanctuary of the house, into the inner sanctuary, the holiest place in the world, the holy of holies, the set-apart of set-apart places. They walk into the holy of holies. They go into the very place where the cherubim are at, right? They're underneath the statue, the place that guards the presence of God. They set it down. Like, this is a momentous occasion. This is crazy. This, this is cool, right? Like, this is something that's been building up for hundreds of years, right? Back in Deuteronomy, God said, when you get into the land, I am going to pick a place for my name to dwell at. And that's where you're going to worship me for all future generations. This moment right here is the reason why Jerusalem to this day is the most hotly contested piece of real estate in the world, right? It's because Jerusalem is the place... <laughs> where God chose to dwell. And all the three primary monotheistic religions agree on this fact, right? Judaism, Islam, Christianity, we all agree that Jerusalem is the place where God came to dwell. That's why everybody wants it, right? It's because at this moment in verse six, the priests place the ark down right here, right? Well, I guess it's less about what happens in verse six and it's more about what happens in verse 10. But... This is like, like, I want you to feel the gravity of this moment because this literally is world-changing stuff, right? The stuff going on in Israel and Gaza right now directly correlates to what is taking place in this chapter. So they go in to the inner sanctuary, to the Holy of Holies, under the wings. For the cherubim spread their wings over the place of the ark. And the cherubim made a covering over the ark and its poles from above. Do you see how, like, the author, like, they're wanting you to visualize this, right? They're wanting you to picture this. Why do you think that is? Makes, I lost my train of thought. That's fine. Why do you think it's so important for us to picture this? There's plenty of other places in the Bible where, like, it doesn't shed this amount of information. Because this is where God's presence is going to be. Yeah. And think about it. People couldn't just regularly go. It's not like everybody just like walk into the Holy of Holies and check this out. Right? This is a rare glimpse of the place where God's going to dwell. In his place. Whenever you can actually access it. Right? And for this brief moment, everybody could see it. Before the cloud came in and covered it all up. Yes? Yeah, like only like the priests are like once a year. Or something yeah. Like it's... The high priest, once a year on the Day of Atonement, right? But for a brief moment, people see it there, right? And in a second, it's going to be obscured from their sight. And it's going to stay obscured until God's presence leaves. And by then, the Ark of the Covenant is probably not there, right? So this is like, it's a, it's a precious moment, right? The Ark is being placed down, and people see the, the wings of the cherubim guarding over the Ark of the Covenant. And we know the theology of that, right? The cherubim are the guardians of the presence of God. Right? They're like the soldiers pacing in front of the entryway. Right? And here they are with their wings hovering over it, casting a shadow over the ark. Like, they're, 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 doing, what they're, they're doing their job. Right? Like it, it's this immense moment where literally it's like you have this king who has arrived at his throne. And he's getting ready to sit down. In this, and like, it's just talking about like, you know, the guards have taken their place at their right and their left. Right? Ready to step in and defend their king. Like that's kind of the imagery going on here. The cherubim spread their wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubim made a covering over the ark and its poles from above. But the poles were so long that the ends of the poles could be seen from the holy place before the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen outside, and they are there to this day. It's interesting that it says the poles are there to this day, but it doesn't say anything about the ark, right? I don't, I don't know what to do with that information. It's kind of weird. Um, but it seems like that seems to imply that the ark is not there, right? Because it goes out of the way to say the poles are still there to this day, but not the ark. Um, but I, I like this detail too, right? Because this honestly seems like a really meaningless detail, but it seems to suggest to you that this is a moment that everybody remembered. Because the author, I can almost guarantee you, the author was not there during this, right? Like assuming the same author wrote the entirety of First and Second Kings, unless this guy lived hundreds of years, he was not there for this moment. But it's almost like these were stories that were passed down by the people who were there, right? And it's like they're holding on to every moment. So even once the Ark of the Covenant is placed there, 
and the people have gone out of it. They're like, but we like like it's like they didn't want to move their eyes from it, and they're like we could still see the poles, right? Like like even once the Ark of the Covenant was covered, we can still see the poles from the outside, right? Like that's what it's kind of getting at here, where it's almost like they're clinging to every single thing until finally they can't see it anymore, right? It's kind of like whenever you're watching a sunset and the sun is just about to dip behind the horizon and you can't look away because you want to see all of it until it disappears, right? That's kind of almost like the weight of this. It's like the beauty of it. Like they're seeing this golden throne room. They're seeing the Ark of the Covenant. They're seeing all this stuff and it's about to disappear from their eyes forever. I need your, what email do you use? For what? For any, the one that you check out every day, is it? No, let's be honest. No, let's be honest. 97 at gmail.com. Okay. Okay. So yeah, if y'all are wanting to email me on YouTube, that's my email. In case y'all are wondering. That was a random interruption, but now you have my email. Now let's be honest, 97 at gmail.com. <laughs> Anyways, back to the message. Uh, <laughs> shameless plug, I guess. I don't know. Commercial break. Commercial break. All right. Um... Verse 9. This is interesting. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone which Moses laid there at Horeb. What is Horeb? It's, it's another name for Mount Sinai, right? Horeb and Mount Sinai are the same place, right? Uh, where Yahweh cut a covenant with the sons of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. All right. Um, let's talk about the last part first, then we'll go back to the first part of that verse. Uh, where Yahweh cut a covenant. What's the deal with cutting a covenant? Like, what, what is that imagery? Didn't we talk about this the other week? Like, it's a really big deal. Yes, so covenants are a really big deal. But why does it say cut a covenant? Like, I know nowadays we say cut a deal or something like that. But whenever it says cut here, it literally means cut. It's supposed to be, like, imagery, like, whenever he made a covenant with, like, Abraham. And yeah. And he cut the animals in half, and he passed through it. And usually both people pass through to say that, like, if I don't hold on my end of the deal, like, this is what's going to happen to me and my people. But with Abraham, only God passed through because it was like a one-way thing. Yeah, so whenever you make a covenant, um, in Hebrew, the phrase is literally to cut a covenant. And that's because there was this ancient practice of, like, whenever people were making a covenant, they would literally cut the carcasses in two. They would lay the carcasses on their sides to make, like, a pathway. And the people would pass through it, and they'd basically saying, like Brianna was pointing out, they would say, may this or worse happen to me if I break my end of the deal. We see a literal example of this in the Abraham story, like she pointed out, um, where basically Abraham, he lays the carcasses out, but then God puts him into a deep sleep, kind of like God put Adam into a deep sleep, right? So Abraham goes to sleep, but in his sleep, he sees a vision of the carcasses, and God is the only one who passes through the carcasses, right? And so whenever God made his covenant to Abraham, he's basically saying it's an unconditional covenant, because he's saying, he's saying, Abraham, no matter what you do, I'm going to hold my end of the deal. So that was the Abrahamic covenant. But with the Mosaic Covenant, they also cut a covenant, right? I mean, it might not have been literally, like, they, they didn't literally go through the motions, but it's the same implication, right? They cut a covenant, uh, and God made this official covenant with them, but with the Mosaic Covenant, it was a conditional thing, right? To where whenever you actually read the laws, um, people actually compare it to what is called a suzerain vassal treaty. Basically, it's the <laughs> idea of, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you, right? And that's what God said, right? God is the suzerain, he's the king. And Israel, they're the vassal state, right? They're the people who listen to the king, right? And God says, if you do this for me as my people, I will do this for you as your God. If you don't do this for me as my people, then I will do this to you as your king, right? Uh, and so the covenant that God made with Israel was a, it was a conditional covenant, right? Uh, and so that's really what, like, I just wanted to explain that phrase. If you ever see cut a covenant in the Bible, that's what it's referring to. So, Horeb is the place where Yahweh cut a covenant with the sons of Israel when they came out of Egypt. It's talking about Mount Sinai, right? So whenever they got out there, remember I talked about them going into Mount Sinai? God gave them the law. That's what it's referring to. But then in verse 9, it says, There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone which Moses laid there at Horeb. What's interesting about that detail? There was more stuff in the ark, wasn't there? There used to be. There used to be three different things in there, right? One of them was this. So whenever it says the tablets of stone, what's it referring to? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, right? Um, God had given them the tablets. And usually when we think of it, we usually think of like one tablet having five commandments, one tablet having the other. Most likely what it is is it's two duplicate tablets, right, that both have all Ten Commandments on them. 
And once again, it's because it's a suzerain vassal treaty. It'd be like one copy is for God, one copy is for the people, right? But both of them are in the Ark of the Covenant because God is traveling with the people, right? And so that's really what those tablets are, right? If you remember, the first copy was destroyed because of the golden calf debacle, right? Moses got mad and threw him down, and then he had to go back up, and God made another one. Um, so that's always been in the Ark of the Covenant, but there were, there were two other things in there as well. Do you remember what they were? The staff kind of thing? I knew that you would remember that one. How did I know Rocky would remember the staff? Um, so, yes. Um, one of them was Aaron's staff, right? Remember the staff that accomplished all these amazing wonders? Um, well, there was this one point in the story with the people of Israel where basically um, they were feuding. Like, the people of Israel grumbled all the time. And they were like, who does Moses think he is? Does he think he's the only one who can speak on behalf of God? And who does Aaron think he is that he's the only one who thinks he can be priest? And so basically, God put them in their place. And God basically said, all right, how about this? Let's get a bunch of people to bring their staffs up. And y'all are going to leave them in the tent overnight. And the one whose staff buds, right, where like a leaf starts growing out of it, that's the person who I've appointed to be my priest. And so all the people leave their staffs in the tent overnight. And then whenever they come the next day, Aaron's staff is the one that buds, right? And so they put that staff in the Ark of the Covenant to commemorate that event, right? There was one other thing that was in the Ark of the Covenant. Do you know what it was? It was something that commemorated their wilderness wanderings. Was it manna? Manna, yes. Um, they put some manna from the wilderness in it. If you remember, um, whenever the people of Israel were in the wilderness, once again, they, they grumbled, right? It seems like really most of their stories begin with grumbling. Uh, and they were like, who does God think he is? He brought us over here to the wilderness to die. And God says, okay, I'll feed you, right? And basically what would happen is that um, they call it bread from heaven, basically, right? Um, they would wake up in the morning, and there were these little flakes of bread, right? It was almost like, they would say it was kind of like dew gathering on the ground, but the dew would harden into these little, like, cakes, right? Uh, and it's, they said it tasted like honey. And they, like, whenever they came out, they said, what is it? And the word, what is it, in Hebrew is mana. <laughs> so, like, the word mana literally means, what is it? Because <laughs> they didn't know what it was. Uh, and so, um, God gave them this, and then he preserved mana for them to put in the Ark of the Covenant to commemorate his provision for them. So those were the three things that used to be in the Ark of the Covenant, but apparently now it's just the tablets. Uh, and once again, we don't know where the other two things went. We don't know if maybe the Philistines took that stuff out whenever they had it, or if it was taken out at some other point. We don't know, right? There's a lot of interesting stuff about the Ark of the Covenant that we're just not aware of. Uh, but for some reason, the only thing that's in there now is the, um, the tablets, which is fine, because really that's the main thing they need, right? Um, they, they want to remember the other stuff, but the tablets are the, uh, that's the covenant, right? And the Mosaic covenant is still in place. They need that. Uh, and so that's in there. Uh, now it happened. Oh, this is the best part. This is great. Now it happened that when the priests came out of the holy place, the cloud filled the house of Yahweh, right? So that the priest could not <coughs> stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of Yahweh filled the house of of Yahweh. Uh, very similar to the book of Exodus. Remember it said that they could not stand in the tabernacle because the cloud was so thick? Same thing, right? It's so thick that they can't stand, right? And it's not saying that they fell on their knees because, no, like it's saying they literally, they had to get out. <laughs> They're like, whoa, <laughs> this is crazy. They had to back out. Uh, do you know the fancy term that people use to refer to the glory cloud of Yahweh? Question. Do you know what the fancy term is that people use to refer to the uh, the glory cloud? It's the Shekinah or Shekinah, uh, depending on how people pronounce it. Um, in Hebrew, it's probably more Shekinah. Um, it means to dwell or to settle, right? It's the Shekinah glory of God. You don't actually see that word show up in the Bible. Um, it shows up in like Jewish commentaries and stuff like that. Um, but you'll hear a lot of commentaries reference the Shekinah glory of God, right? Um, but, but that's what this is, right? It's the glory cloud, right? Uh, now it happened when the priests came out of the holy place, right? So the priests have exited, right? And now that everything has been emptied out and they have come out of the place, 
God makes his amazing entrance, right? The, gl- the cloud comes. I, I just want to see the sight, right? I wish I could be there for this, right? All the people there, Solomon standing there, everybody's probably singing and praising God. The cloud comes in and it fills the house, right? And really, God's presence was already in the Ark and Covenant, right? I mean, like, so God's presence was already there, right? But this is his cloud, like, affirming his presence, right? It's saying, like, boom, I'm here, right? It's affirming that something amazing has happened. So that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, right? It was so powerful that they had to get even further away. For the glory of Yahweh filled the house of Yahweh. This is just one of the most, this is one of the coolest moments ever. Um, anything that y'all want to say about this before we move on? Anytime I think, I mean, this is just personally, anytime I look at the clouds, I'm, I think of the presence of God. Really? I really do. Interesting. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Anybody else? Cool. All right. Verses 12 through 21. Then Solomon said, Yahweh has said that he would dwell in the cloud of dense gloom. I have surely built you a whole lofty house, a place for your dwelling forever. Then the king turned his face around and blessed all the assembly of Israel, while all the assembly of Israel was standing. And he said, Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Israel, who spoke with, who spoke with his mouth to my father David, and has fulfilled it by his hand, saying, Since the day that I have brought my people Israel from Egypt, I did not choose a city out of all the tribes of Israel in which to build a house, that my name might be there. But I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. And it was in, and it was in the heart of my father David to build a house for the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel. But Yahweh said to my father David, Because it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the house, but your son, who will come forth from your loins, he shall build the house for my name. And Yahweh has established his word, which he spoke. And I have been established in place of my father David, and sit on the throne of Israel, as Yahweh promised. And I have built the house for the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel. And there I have set a place for the ark, in which is the covenant of Yahweh, which he cut with our fathers when he brought them from the land of Egypt. Perfect. Cool. Um, I do need to correct something that I said earlier. Um, <clears throat> It's the word for assembly here that is um, kahel, which is also ecclesia, um, the whole church thing that I mentioned earlier. Um, the other word was eda, like the word for congregation is eda. Really, everything I said earlier applies to this. I just was talking about the wrong word. Um, I was thinking that this translation just translated differently, but it's assembly here is the word kahel. Whenever he was reading it, I was like, oh, wait a second. I think I misspoke. So all the stuff I said there applies to this, not the other word, but... It's still the same word, right? It's still the same implications. Okay, anything stick out to y'all here? Or anything of note that you want to bring up? It mentions the history of Israel. Uh, It mentions the land of Egypt, brought them out of Egypt, David. Yeah. uh, Wanting to build a house for God, but didn't. Yeah. Solomon, David's son, building it. Yeah, do you see why I wanted to slow down when it comes to this chapter? There's a lot of historical, like, it, it feels like a culmination moment, right? It almost feels like a series finale of a TV show where, like, as you're building to, like, the climax, all of a sudden there's a flashback to, like, how far we've come, right? It's like, ooh, here's a flashback from season one, season three, season four. Just so y'all know, I'm making my Smallville. <laughs> my favorite TV show is Smallville, and during the season finale, or series finale, there's, like, a moment where, like, it's like, Here's all these favorite, like your favorite moments from all these seasons. That's what this feels like to me, right? To where like there's this huge moment and you have flashbacks to Exodus and this and that and this and that. That's why I wanted to slow down and cover it all because um, it's some really good stuff. Yes? It also mentions the Ark of the Covenant, which is really important because that's the covenant. You know. Yeah, it's like it's called the Ark of the Covenant for a reason. It is the Ark, right? The holding place of the covenant, right? <laughs> it's a pretty big deal. Right? It's the presence of God, which is literally hovering over the covenant itself. Which is what makes it so sad whenever the presence of God leaves. Because it's basically saying that covenants kind of like, you know, you know he, he, he's, he's mad at them. Um, Alright. Uh, another thing just to notice, um, especially the back part that um, 
Solomon's saying right there, what does that remind you of? Like the language he's using. Talk about verse 21, right? Uh, well, no, just, just like really the back half of that paragraph. It says, my name, my people, my, like, it mentions like, like a lot of that. Okay. But is there anything, I mean, he's talking about David a whole lot here. Yeah. What specifically do you think Solomon has in mind? The Davidic Covenant? The Davidic Covenant, right? Um, you'll notice that Solomon is making mention of a lot of covenants throughout this, mm-hmm. right? Because really that's what this is about, right? I mean, the Abrahamic Covenant, what did God say? I'll make you a great nation. I'll make you great. You'll be a blessing to the whole world. And in you, all the families of the world will be blessed, right? God said he was choosing the people of Israel to bless all the nations. What is the temple? A house of prayer for all the nations, right? God told the people of Israel that if they were faithful to his covenant, he would come to dwell in their midst. He's coming to dwell in their midst. God told David in his covenant that his son would build a house for his name and that he would be as a father to David's son. Boom. Right? So this moment really is, like, that's why I'm saying it feels like almost a climax moment for the Bible. Right? Because you have all of the major covenants given so far, other than the Noahic covenant. But the Noah, the covenant to Noah is just kind of a little bit different deal. Because basically God just promised I'm not going to flood the earth again. And so we're not even really dealing with that right here, right? <laughs> but all the other covenants since then, they're all coming they're coming to a climax right here. And with Solomon, keep in mind, when it comes to the Abrahamic covenant, it almost seems fulfilled, right? Because God promised land, seed, blessing, right? Solomon has almost acquired all of the land, right? Like, like they have reached the borders that God promised, essentially, right? Israel has become a nation, right? Solomon's being faithful to God, so he looks like the seed who's going to crush the serpent. And they're blessing the world, and they have been blessed. So it feels like the Abrahamic covenant could be fulfilled right here. And the people are following the law. They've got the Ark of the Covenant. Like, it feels like all three of these covenants could be fulfilled in this moment, right? And so that's why there's such heavy covenant language. It's because, it, it, like, Solomon probably has it in his mind that this is it, right? Like, this is what human history has been building up to. Then Solomon said, Yahweh has said that he would dwell in the cloud of dense gloom. I have surely built you a lofty house, a place for your dwelling forever. Okay. Um, Anytime you see like the narrative break into poetry, that's usually the author of the book telling you, hey, pay attention to this because this is going to help you interpret the rest of it. Right? So let's talk about that. Um, Also, I think we'll probably just make it our goal to get through these verses, and then we'll just wrap up. Yahweh has said that he would dwell in the cloud of dense gloom. Um, I'm assuming gloom's not being used in the same sense. Yeah, it's it's being used a little bit different. Like, whatever we think of gloom, what do we think of? I think sad. We think of sad. Um, I think it's probably implying darkness, right? Gloom, in the sense of, it's a dark cloud. Like, it's it's, it's weighty. Yes. Uh, let me look up what the actual Hebrew phrase is there. Um, interlinear. Az Amar Shlomo Yehovah Amar Shakan Arapel. So Shakan, that's where we get like the word Shekinah, right? Like like the Shekinah glory, like that he would dwell. Um, it just means to settle down. Um, so thick cloud is Arapel. Uh, in Hebrew, no, it just means a heavier dark cloud, darkness, right? The first place where this shows up is in Exodus chapter 20, um, right after God delivered the Ten Commandments, right? So the people stood at a distance, but Moses came near the dark cloud where God was, right? So that's where God came to dwell first. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, Moses recapping it. You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, at the very bur- mountain that burned with fire, the very heart of the heavens, Darkness cloud and a dark cloud, a dense gloom, right? Um, 2 Samuel chapter 22, he bowed the heavens and came down with a dark cloud. This is David singing his song to God, right? And then 1 Kings chapter 8, right? And so this is only like the fifth or sixth time that this word actually shows up here, but it's always associated with God's presence, right? It's a dark cloud, right? Because it's the weightiness of it. Also important thing that I want to highlight here, in the Bible... Who is the one who rides the clouds? 
God. Lamb of God. Right? The main reason I'm highlighting that is because later on in the Bible, this is going to be significant. Um, this is a bit of foreshadowing. Um, whenever like you read Genesis chapter 1, God gives man dominion over the earth, but the heavens and the earth belong to God. Right? So God's the one in charge of the weather and stuff. Right? So the clouds belong to him. Right? And Exodus, um, once he leads the people out of, Israel, uh, out of Egypt, how does he guide them? The cloud. A cloud by day, fire by night. Right? God is the one, like the cloud is where his presence is at. He comes to Mount Sinai. How does he come to dwell on the mountain? In a cloud. In a cloud. Right? Whenever he's in the tabernacle, he goes in a cloud. Right here, he comes in a cloud. So throughout the whole Bible, God is the one who dwells in the clouds. Right? You get to Daniel chapter 7. Right? And I'm basically just foreshadowing this because it's important. Um, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has a vision. And he says, Behold, I saw one like a son of man riding on the clouds of heaven. And he came before the Ancient of Days and received from him authority and dominion to judge the nations of the earth. So Daniel says that he sees a person who looks like a man who is riding the clouds. Which is weird because you know that only God rides the clouds. Right? That's what the Old Testament teaches. Mm -hmm. But this person looks like a man, but he's riding the clouds. And then he goes up to the Ancient of Days, which is God. And he gets authority to judge the earth, which is what God does. Mm -hmm. And so basically Daniel says, I saw a person who looked like, God, looked like a man doing what only God can do. And then God went up to God and received from God what only God can have. Mm -hmm. But he looked like a man. And he called this guy, this, like he looked like a son of man. Mm -hmm. You get to the Gospels. And Jesus calls himself, his favorite title for himself, is Son of Man. And then, whenever he stands before the high priest, he is silent the entire time. And then finally the high priest says to him, I adjure you, are you the Son of God? And he says, you have said so. And truly I tell you, the next time you see me, you will see the Son of Man riding on the clouds of heaven. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's where, like, and then this is why the high priest rips his garments and says, this man has committed blasphemy. So whenever people tell you that Jesus never claimed to be God, you have to realize that's why they killed him. Because he says, I'm the son of man who rides the clouds. And the high priest knows for a fact, God's the one who rides the clouds. And Jesus just called himself that. And he just told the high priest, next time you see me, I'm going to be the one judging you. Mm -hmm. Right? Because when the son of man rides the clouds, he receives authority to judge the earth. And so he, he literally looks the high priest in the face and says, yeah, next time you see me, I'll be riding the clouds. And then he's like, you did not. And so that's why Jesus is handed over to the Romans, right? It's because he is asserting he is God, right? And so that's why I just want to highlight that. Yahweh said he would dwell in a cloud of dense gloom. Jesus says, I'm the one who does that. Jesus claimed to be Yahweh, right? Solomon says, I have surely built you a lofty house, right? And you think that he's just talking about the temple, but it isn't just the temple, Right? A place for your dwelling forever. Well, Solomon's going to acknowledge later in his prayer that this temple really, like, it can be torn down. And it will be torn down. Mm -hmm. Right? But Jerusalem is the place that really Solomon's built up. And this is where God's going to dwell. And he's going to dwell there forever. Right? Whenever you get to Revelation, Jerusalem's still there. Right? There's a new heavens, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. And there's not going to be a temple there because Jerusalem itself is the temple. Right? Um, and so that's kind of what we're setting up here, right? I've built for you a lofty house, a place for your dwelling forever, right? This is why even to this day, I think Jerusalem's a super important place, right? Um, maybe God is not dwelling there in the same way that he did in the past or he will in the future, but there's still some promises surrounding this place. That's why I love Jerusalem. It's so cool to go there. We should all go there together sometime. Maybe one of the things are a little bit calmer. Then the king turned his face around, right? So you have Solomon, like, I love that he's the one who initiates this whole ceremony. He talks to God first. And then he turns around and he blesses the assembly, the kahel, the ecclesia, the church of Israel, while all the assembly of Israel was standing. So everybody's standing there. And then I love, like, it's weird how Solomon, he's not a priest, but he's still taking the initiative here, right? And this is, once again, returning us to that weird place where, like, it's hard to define exactly what the king of Israel's role is, right? Because he's functioning as a king over a people who are already supposed to have a king, right? God is supposed to be their king, right? But he can't quite be a priest either because only a Levite can be a priest. 
But he's definitely still a religious figure, right? Like, that, that's without saying, right? Because inherently, Israel's government is built on religion, right? And in other cultures, it wasn't totally unheard of for a king to function as a priest as well, right? A lot of the times, it actually was the king who functioned in a priestly role, right? Because the kings were so closely associated with the gods. And so, like, Solomon isn't quite that, but he is something, right? He's not a priest, but he tiptoes very closely. He's not going to cross the line and do, like, what King Saul did and offer a sacrifice, but he is going to function in this somewhat like mediatorial like level where he, like he's like it's not the priest it's not even the high priest who's taking the initiative here it's Solomon right God's presence came to dwell and Solomon prays to God and then Solomon turns to the people right so it's very interesting like what Solomon's doing here so he turns his face and blesses all the assembly of Israel while all the assembly of Israel is standing and he said blessed be Yahweh the God of Israel who spoke with his mouth to my father David and has fulfilled it by his hand. Um, so what's he asserting about God right there? What about the character of God? He's faithful. He's faithful, right? He spoke it to David in the past, and on this day he has fulfilled it. Right? This is what he said. Since the day that I brought my people Israel from Egypt, I did not choose a city out of all the tribes of Israel in which to build a house that my name might be there. But I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. Right? So this is actually kind of cool. God allowed David to choose the place. Right? God promised Moses that he was going to choose a place. But the people asked for a king. And so God picked a man after his own heart. And he allowed David to pick the place. What city did David choose for the capital? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Right? One of his first orders of business. Right? Second Samuel chapter 5, I think it was. David becomes king. He conquers Jerusalem. He makes it the capital. Chapter 6, he brings the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Right? David is the one who made this city significant. This shows a lot of respect that God had for David. Right? Since the day I brought my people of Israel out of Egypt, I didn't choose a city out of all the tribes of Israel to which, in which to build a house that my name might be there. But I've chosen David to be over my people of Israel. I chose David... And he's the one who picked the place. I didn't pick it. He did. Right? Uh, and also, David's the one who wanted to build the house to begin with. Right? I like that Solomon begins by giving credit to David. Right? Solomon isn't like, look, my building project is done. Like, he admits, he's like, no, this is my dad's building project. Right? I'm, I might be the one who did it. But it was my dad's heart that got us here. Right? So he's giving credit where credit's due. And he's giving credit to the man after God's own heart. David, like, sowed the seeds of it so that Solomon could harvest it. Yes, right? Uh, like Paul says, right? One might plant the seeds, another one uh, may tend to the growth, and another one might reap the harvest, right? So we all have different roles. David planted the seed, Solomon is reaping the harvest, for sure. And it was in the heart of my father David to build a house for the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel, right? It all started with a desire, right? David wanted to build it in his heart. And we know... What about David's heart? He was a man after God's heart. He's a man after God's own heart. So if it was in David's heart, it's probably a good thing. Right? In this context, right? There's other times where David's heart was not too great. But in this context, it was good. Right? It was in the heart of my father David to build a house for the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel. But Yahweh said to my father David, Because it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the house, but your son who will come from your loins. He shall build the house for my name. So he points out, David, I love your desire, but that's not the job I have for you. Application-wise, I think that's an important thing for us to realize. Um, all because you have a good desire does not necessarily mean that's from God. Right? This is something that I've learned more and more as I read the Bible. Right? A lot of the times we think, oh, well, I don't think this could hurt, and so we think that it's from God. Well, not necessarily. Right? Because there's a lot of good things you can want to do. Right? I mean, I've been reading about this in Romans. Right? Paul, he talks about how desperately he wants to visit Rome. He's like, you know, man, I've tried so many times. I've set my plans. I've wanted to go there. But I'm a slave to Christ Jesus. And God keeps sending me other places. But he, he says, I want to go to y'all, and I want to preach the gospel, and I want to fulfill my ministry with y'all. 
but I'm under obligation to everybody. And so where God sends, I have to go. Does that mean that Paul's desire to visit Rome was bad? No. He wanted to go there to disciple them and to help them grow, which is a good thing. But he said that he ultimately wanted to submit to God more. Same thing with David. Yes? Were you, were you raising your hand or were you stretching? I'm stretching. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, but I think this is something that we should all reflect on. Like, I try to reflect on this a lot. Um, there's a lot of things I want to do, right? I would love to write books. I love writing music. I love doing, like, all these sorts of things. And really the hardest thing for me is figuring out what is it that God wants me to do, right? Even, like, this whole YouTube channel thing I do. Like, there's a lot of YouTube people I partner with, and they're like, man, why don't you dedicate more time to trying to grow your channel? It's because I don't know if that's what God wants me to do. I enjoy doing it, and so I will do it, but if it's going to grow, I'm going to need God to do that for me, to send me a clear message that that's what he wants me to do, right? Uh, and so, like, that's something where it's really trying to figure out what is the right path to take, right? And I, I just like that Solomon acknowledges that, right? God told David, hey, this is a good thing that you want to build a house for me, but it's not the job I want for you, right? Because God was really wanting David to establish the kingdom, and he wanted David to strengthen it and really make it firm so that Solomon could reign during a time of peace and actually do this, right? So he just had different goals, right? Uh, if you're supposed to be the candlestick in the temple, you shouldn't try to be a stone, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we have to figure out what God wants us to do in life, right? That should really be our goal. Uh, it does, that doesn't mean it's bad to be a candlestick or a stone, it's just bad to be a candlestick when you're supposed to be a stone. And it's bad to be a stone when you're supposed to be a candlestick. Right? That's what we need to figure out. Is it our job to build the temple or to solidify the kingdom? Right? That's what we should try to figure out in life. But Yahweh said to my father David, because it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the house, but your son who will come forth from your loins, he shall build the house for my name. Right? When, when did God say this? Before Solomon was born? Yes. Second Samuel chapter... Guess in seven. Seven, yes. Um, that's just one of those chapters you always want to kind of have at the forefront of your mind because it's a super important chapter. Right? Second Samuel chapter seven. And Yahweh has established his word which he spoke. Once again, what's the emphasis on? Same thing as earlier. He has established his word. But he's faithful. God's faithfulness. Yes. Right? So even as he's blessing the people of Israel, who's he worshiping? God. God. Right? He's emphasizing that God is faithful. He's pointing out that this is a climactic moment. All those things that God promised to his father, all the things that God promised to generations past, they're coming to a head right here. Right? Yahweh has established his word which he spoke. And I have been established in place of my father David and sit on the throne of Israel as Yahweh promised. Right? He doesn't say that I've, I'm here because I'm the best king fit for the job. He doesn't say, I'm here because of the workings of, um, you know, Benaiah, son of Jehoiada. No, he says, I'm here because God promised so, right? His throne is thanks to God, right? That, that's how he views this. And I have built the house for the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel, right? Like this is his home, right? He doesn't just, he doesn't say temple, he says house, right? I built God's house. This is where the king, the real king of Israel, is going to come dwell, right? And there I have set a place for the ark, in which is the covenant of Yahweh. Which covenant is referring to? The Abraham? Mosaic. Mosaic. Mosaic, right? Right, so there's the Noahic, Abrahamic, um, Mosaic, and Davidic. There's going to be a fifth one, but we're not at that point in the story yet. Um... But this is referring to the Mosaic one, right? Mosaic covenant, right? There I set the ark, and which is the covenant of Yahweh, right? And this is on the tablets, right? It's the, the covenant is inside of it. Uh, which he cut with our fathers when he brought them from the land of Egypt, right? Which that's hundreds of years earlier, right? Solomon is talking about this. This is in about 900, um, oh gosh, 966, oh no. 958-ish BC, I believe. I think that's about where we're at. The Exodus could have happened roughly 300 to 500 years earlier, right? Whether you pick the 1200 or 1400s date, right? So what he's pointing out here is that this moment has been one hundreds of years in the making. God promised the people he would pick a place for his name to dwell, right? 
And David is the one who brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, but that was still the Ark of the Covenant. That's a mobile device. Now, God has moved in, right? He's no longer a nomad wandering like Abraham through the, um, like, you know, in a tent. No. Just like the people of Israel have come to dwell in their land and be fixed, God is now going to be fixed, right? This is the fulfillment of what God promised in Deuteronomy, right? God's been in the Ark of the Covenant for the longest time, but now I have set the Ark of the Covenant down, right? This language is kind of implying the idea that the Ark of the Covenant might not be necessary anymore, mm -hmm. right? I have found a place for the Ark of the Covenant to be set. All right, well, now that it's there, it doesn't have to move anymore, mm -hmm. right? Because this is where God's going to dwell. We'll continue with this next week. Or actually, no, we won't. Because next week um, is Thanksgiving week, and next week we're actually going to have a little field trip. And we are going to go to First Baptist Seabrook, my church, uh, and we're going to celebrate Thanksgiving with them. Because there's going to be, there's like a whole Thanksgiving feast thing. Um, and so uh, after we wrap this up, I'll do like a head count and stuff and see who's actually going to join us. Um, it'll be a fun time. But we will finish chapter 8 the week after that, Lord willing. Sound good? Cool. Um, real quick, uh, is there any final thoughts y'all want to share? Maybe any points of application or something that um, you want to bring up before we actually wrap this up? Going back to what you said about uh, doing what God uh, wants you to do, just seek His guidance. For sure. Don't try to be something that you're not. Really. Yep. I would say that the God that we see here is the same God that we serve. So we serve the God who's the Ancient of Days, so we know that if he's faithful here, that he is going to be faithful now and in the future. <coughs> yeah, that, that's a big point that we need to realize, right? Anytime that somebody in the Bible experiences God's faithfulness, that is supposed to teach us something about God, right? It's not like God was faithful to all the people in the Bible and is just going to suddenly abandon his faithfulness. Mm -hmm. Well, no, because that same faithful God says that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? And so if he was faithful then, he's going to be faithful now. Right, so we, we should take that and also, you know, um, we shouldn't be disheartened by the fact that it's taken him so long to return, right? He will, right? Um, the people of Israel were probably being like, all right, we're going to go into the land and God's going to immediately pick a place to dwell. No, it took a few hundred years. It's all right. God, God works on a different timetable. It's okay. He's very patient. Um, we should probably learn to be as well. Anything else? God's going to do something, it might not be immediately, but it will eventually happen. Yeah. Yeah, it will happen. Maybe not when you want it to, but it will. It's when you need it to happen. All right. Sean, could you close this out in prayer? <coughs> Father God, thank you for allowing us to gather here today to go through your word. And I just pray that... <coughs> We would leave this Bible study desiring you more than ever and that none of your words would um, fall to the ground, but rather that they would actually result in a change of the heart and a change in our lifestyle, um, not just publicly, but privately. Um, as you tell us, um, you know, when you go to your room to <clears throat> pray and to um, have a relationship with you just as much as you would. Um, out on the street and so I just I just pray that we would continue to um, desire you and that we would be a part of the solution the world needs um, we're thankful for you um, and let that gratitude keep us moving forward and that's your name we pray amen, amen.